Namaste everyone. A very good evening. We are extremely happy to have an eminent physician with us today, Dr. Avnik Basu. And Sir has a lot of feathers in his crown. I would like to read out a few. Uh, sir is an MBBS, silver medalist and an MD. He won several scholarships from the Government of India, Ministry of Human Resource Development of Higher Education, Calcutta Club Limited and several other institutions. A physician in Kolkata for almost five years now. Recently, in January 2021, he has also been felicitated as a frontline COVID warrior by the social organization Bokeshat. And all of that that I just said is just it covers only 10% of his achievements. So we are thrilled to have him today. And thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. We welcome you to Swarnim. Our children are really excited to interact with you. They have set several questions, their queries for you. I have to start the session. Okay. So I think first up, we have a student from class five, Debarko De. Debarko, you can start. Namaste, sir. My question is, how does it feel to be a doctor? How does it feel to be a doctor? That's a good question. Uh, good. I wish to be a doctor. I won't say I'm proud to be a doctor. Rather, I'm privileged or I'm honored to be a part of this, you know, uh, most noble profession, as we say. Because it is only this profession, perhaps, where we get to come in contact with people's lives. We are entrusted upon with the responsibility of saving people's life. And definitely, that is the most noble thing that one can ever imagine to do. It's indeed a great achievement when you, when you see a monument patient getting recovered from a serious illness and going back home. And at the end of the day, you receive a gratitude, you receive thanks, when tells you, thanks a lot, doctor, for saving my life. It's these few words that make up your day. It's not about money, it's not about social position, it's not about just honor, but definitely it's about this small gratitude. Thank you for saving my life. That makes this profession the most special. And definitely, I'm privileged to be a part of this profession. I'm too young, as Monkita Lam has just mentioned, I've been practicing around five years. Hopefully, I'll go on for a few more years. At the end of my practice, I'll say that I'm privileged to be a part of this. Thank you, sir. Next, I think I'll, uh, Tanisha has some question. Tanisha Mishra from class four. Hello, sir. My question is, how did you decide to be a doctor and help people? How did I decide to be a doctor? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, when I was of your age, you are in class four, right? I think you are in class four. When I was in your age, I never, uh, you know, imagined to become a dog. My ambition was, I, I still love animals a lot. So I wanted to be a forest officer. So that, you know, I can come in touch with wild animals, get to see them, get to touch, see them. But as I grew up, maybe uh, a sense of responsibility started, you know, developing inside me. Uh, as I started interacting with my friends, with people, with my family members, and also you'll get to learn all these things as you grow up, as you go up uh, the classes, then I felt that being a doctor is definitely the most responsible and the most honorable ambition that you can ever have to save a person's life. Like if you are uh, crossing a street and you see suddenly someone falling down uh, or getting knocked down by a car. It's only you who have that, who has that skill, who has that knowledge, and who has that, uh, you know, confidence to go and save that person. It's not the other people on the street. They can watch, they can more, maximum what they can do. They can, you know, call a car and uh, help him to, uh, take, uh, help take him to a hospital. But it's only you, you can save someone's life. For example, like uh, if you are flying somewhere, okay, you're inside an aircraft and you see a lady uh, suddenly, you know, 
falling down, maybe having a chest pain or anything like that. And, and everyone, every single passenger will shout out, is there a lawyer? No one will ask, is there a lawyer? No one will ask, is there a pilot? No. Is there a doctor? Because when it comes to saving a person's life, it's only you. So probably it's that sense that has, you know, uh, helped me develop this feeling that I should be a doctor. I should be someone who can be trusted to save someone's life. So probably that's how I decided to become a doctor. Wanted to ask, Aish. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, sir. My question is, what will you advise the students who want to pursue the medical profession? Uh, the first advice that I'll give is definitely not just you should study always. No, that's not the advice that I should give. Rather, the very first advice I'll give to someone who aspires to be a doctor in future is first become a good human being. In every profession, you will find someone who is excelling in his particular field. Being an actor, anyone, be a cricketer. But it's hard to find someone with a golden heart. If you have a golden heart, and then if you are a doctor, so it's this brilliant combination of profession and humanity that should be blended properly. And only that can help you to become a doctor because it's it doesn't, a doctor's responsibility doesn't end by giving a medication. A doctor's responsibility also includes to read someone's mind, to read the patient's mind, to feel his pain, and to strike at the right exact point so that you can help that person come out of that pain. How you can do it? Not just by studying, you know, line by line through uh, fat textbooks, uh, scoring. Uh, to have a golden heart, you need to have empathy. You need to have sympathy. You need to, you know, penetrate the minds of someone who is coming to you for treatment. So my first advice would be become a good human being. Develop the human ethics, first of all. That's number one. Secondly, obviously, if you are choosing to become a doctor, then you should be very sincere regarding your studies, sincere regarding your responsibilities, not the study. It should be sincere about your responsibilities. And third, you should not study hard on this, rather you should study smartly. You should know what you need to know, you should know what you do not need to know. So all these three things should come, point number one, two and three. You must, uh, you know, keep in mind all these three points if you want to become a doctor. Thank you, ma'am. My next question is, how does a stethoscope work? Well, actually, this question is a very popularly asked question. Many people doubt that how does a stethoscope work? Well, if you need to know how a stethoscope works, then you need to have a sound knowledge in physics. Okay. It will be difficult for me to summarize the entire mechanism of how a stethoscope works in this short, you know, talk. But since you asked the question, uh, I think I should answer. If you have already gone through, or if you have this idea about, basically what's doing is, we use uh, a pair of, you know, uh, tubings that we plug into our ear, and there's a single tubing with some rounded uh, thing stuck on one side, we call it the diaphragm of a stethoscope, and we place it on a person's chest or wherever we need to hear the sound from. Now the sound that is coming from the heart, it vibrates the diaphragm, it strikes the diaphragm. It's almost like uh, what you are hearing, in, uh, how you are hearing through a headphone, okay? Like you are uh, plugging the ear headphones, it's in a similar fashion. So basically, it picks up the sound waves from the heart, it amplifies, that it magnifies, it increases the sound waves, it synchronizes the sound waves, and uh, they travel to our ear. And that's how we come to know whether it's a normal heartbeat or it's an abnormal heartbeat. So it, this is in short how a stethoscope works. But definitely, uh, you need to use it once so that you can understand how it actually works. Good question. Uh, but maybe early to ask 
for your age, but definitely it's good to know what curious regarding working our stethoscope. Wishing to see you someday on my chair, maybe after around 10 years or so. Let's see. Okay. Um, I think our youngest student has one more question. Yes, Tanisha. Sir, my another question is, how did you recognize disease by symptoms? That's also quite, you know, a uh, question that is quite typical for our profession. Typical symptoms. There are different diseases. And each disease has got an uh, innumerable number of symptoms. Symptom means what a patient says. For example, if you are coming with some complaints, and you are telling me the symptoms, like you are having fever, you are having cough, you are having throat pain, you are having chest pain, you are having body pain. These are the symptoms which you see. Okay. And uh, there are several symptoms which are common in different diseases. But we need to listen to all the symptoms. Uh, not only the symptoms, we need to examine the patient as well. And only then we have a holistic idea of what is happening inside. Only then can we come to a conclusion that, okay, this probably is a disease. Is this disease. Maybe it's dengue. Or it's okay. My question is, have you ever encountered with any patient who panicked unnecessarily? If yes, how did you manage such a situation? Uh, people who panic unnecessarily. There are a lot of patients who panic unnecessarily. For example, uh, even students panic a lot, mostly before examination. I've had a number of uh, patients who come with me, like examination two days later on, and they're suddenly uh, having, you know, breathing issues, having chest pain, feeling nervous, not feeling like eating or even throwing out just two days before. And he's a young patient, not having any significant medical history, then we really need to talk to the patient. That's what we need to do. We need to talk to him. If by talking to him, we can see that he's answering quite normally or he is communicating quite normally, then we definitely come to a conclusion that he has no heart core disease, rather is having something which we call a panic spell or panic attack or anxiety issue that we see, maybe fear or something like that. Okay, worrying. Uh, the best way is to counsel him or her to know what's the problem he or she is facing. And uh, that's the way to have empathy. That is, you need to penetrate the mind of the person to know what is actually happening inside. Uh, because it's all panic means basically it's all inside the mind. There's nothing elsewhere in the body. Whatever problem he or she is facing, it's originating in the mind. So you need to penetrate the mind of that person and make him speak out to you the problem that he's having. And you can easily understand uh, his situation. Then you need to talk to him, you counsel him, and he or she can definitely come out of the panic. Sometimes we need to a different issue, but mostly talking to each other helps a lot. Sir, I have heard that the Delta Plus variant of the coronavirus will affect children more. What do you suggest we do to prevent it? Uh, there is no, no such medical literature uh, yet available that confirms that Delta strain of coronavirus is going to affect only children. It's probably the nurse who seem to know more than doctors these days, and they are the ones who spread this news everywhere that uh, this group is going to be affected, this group is not going to be affected. Well, I'll uh, advise that whether it's the delta or the alpha or the beta or the gamma, it really doesn't matter much. What matters is if you can follow the precautions that we have been mentioning since 2020, the very first day that uh, coronavirus has, uh, pandemic has been recognized. If you can follow those precautions, that is wearing face masks, maintain proper hand hygiene, maintain social distancing, drink proper diet, then definitely you can avert the uh, harmful effects of coronavirus infection, even if it's a Delta strain. Okay, I don't think there is need to panic because we are slowly getting to understand how this virus works. Maybe it will need more time. We need more time to understand fully how the virus works. 
but definitely since the last one and a half years we have known quite much and that will probably help us to counter this uh, third wave but the best way to prevent the third by following the precautions this question is something related to today's situation what has been your professional experience as a doctor during the pandemic there's been a lot of experience i have i mostly treat uh, patients more than above 10 years of age that is more of adolescents and adults i usually don't treat children but since i visit a lot of patients in the home so i have had, i seem to have you know gathered more insight into a patient environment than probably other doctors practicing in the city and i have had a lot of experiences some good some bad uh i have if i take into account the first wave that is 2020 until present date maybe i have i have treated more than 500 patients from covid and almost 98% of the patients have well survived a few patients i fail to say because obviously they came with a lot of complications so those were a few bad experiences maybe the failures that i met with but in most of the cases i had been successful in saving them uh i did get different sort of patients some with mild infection severe infections most of them i have managed to treat at home with the best care possible even by setting up a mini icu at home i have treated a hell lot of patients not only in the city but even outside the city in other districts i have helped a lot uh the, they are doing quite good but yes if you take into account the current wave that is the second wave then uh patients who have recovered from covid they are having a few complications they have a few complaints few symptoms that probably they never experienced before this so we are mostly counseling them we are giving the medications we are asking them that okay if life has changed if something uh, additional you are experiencing now which you never experienced before try to slowly adapt to that change because it is a new disease we do not always know if we are able to treat 100% of all the symptoms maybe some will persist but if we try to accept those changes if we try to adapt to this new way of life maybe our lives will be as happy as as happy as and this is more important for children <clears throat> for youngsters right because we are more accustomed to working outside to going to schools going to offices it's becoming very difficult for us to stay at home and do all these things like uh, even we never had the experience of you know online school at home is this generation you are having this experience it's a new way of life it's definitely very difficult to adapt to the change so fast but we need some time and definitely with time i think more innovative ways will be available to us to adapt to this schooling probably will have more innovations in the near future and students will be, uh, and will be more student friendly i definitely believe if technology has advanced there it will gift us with something good that will definitely help us in our lives thank you sir that covers all the questions that our students wanted to ask and it was very insightful and especially uh, i would like to thank you for highlighting on the positive aspects of the present situation as you said that adaptability is a key to all of our students learn something from that and uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge your experience your expertise with all our students and we are very thankful and we express our heartfelt gratitude to you and all the other doctors who have been tirelessly working at the wake of the pandemic Thank you so much sir for coming today